This is Sam Smith on his daily routine monitoring the beach. In rain, hail or shine, Sam is seen just after sunrise every morning making observations and measurements which he records onto spreadsheets. Sam is a retired coastal engineer who has studied and lectured in the United States. During that time he has had 60 papers published. For more than 30 years he has been involved in all aspects of restoration and preservation of the 42 kilometres of Gold Coast beaches. The beach is a very, very large structure. We're standing leaning against the dune, which is the landward edge of it, and 80 metres away is the water. That's the visible beach, that's what everybody sees, and that's what they take to be the beach. Actually, most of the beach is underwater and the sand goes right out to a depth of 50 to 70 metres. In other words, four or five miles offshore. We only see about one and a half percent of it. Ocean beaches are in a constant state of change. The action of the waves picks up sand, moving and depositing it according to weather conditions, tides and currents. During storms, sand is scoured from the beach, flattening it and reducing its level. At high tide, it can seem like the beach has disappeared altogether. The sand generated from this process settles further out in the form of sandbars. As these newly formed sandbars increase in size, they serve to trip larger waves, thereby reducing their intensity and protecting the beach from further erosion. This process can be observed when waves break offshore before moving onto the beach. When calmer conditions return, the gentler action of the waves carries the sand back up to the beach, eventually returning it to its former level and slope. After severe erosion, it can take several years to complete this replenishment process. In conjunction with this cycle, currents combine to cause a net migration of sand northwards along the Gold Coast foreshore. Historically, inflows and outflows have balanced out and Gold Coast beaches have been relatively stable for thousands of years. That was before man's intervention. It all started at Jumpin' Pin. Well, Jumpin' Pin is one of the local coastal disasters because it was man-made. Originally, there were two islands north of our spit, Stradbroke Island, and Morton Island with the Southern Passage in between. Then in 1894, a bark the Cambus Wallace was wrecked at Jumpin' Pin, which was then just the beach. She was on a maiden voyage from Glasgow in Scotland with a very valuable cargo, mainly scotch and dynamite. They salvaged all the scotch. They had to try and get oxen carts and horse and carts over a soft sand dune. So what they did was bring the oxen out with blades behind them and they demolished the dune right down to beach level so they could ship the cargo straight through into the broad water and load it on barges. Four years later, after two more major cyclones and the biggest since 1814, the dunes were completely breached and the entrance stabilised itself. But the big problem then was originally the tidal compartment in the Broadwater half flowed out between Morton and Stradbroke and half through the Broadwater. When Jumpin' Pin was built, it picked up half, leaving a quarter for the others. So that accelerated the drift of the Broadwater entrance dramatically and changed the whole hydraulics of the northern end of the beach and has been busily blocking the southern channel ever since. 
The northerly drift of sand along Gold Coast beaches takes place at the rate of half a million cubic metres every year. Walls and groins interrupt this natural migration, causing sand to build up on one side of the wall and erode on the other. The main problem with the Gold Coast beaches is not erosion per se or along the beach itself, but it's the result of the tweed training walls being extended in the mid to early 60s. For this reason, it has been necessary to replenish the sand on the Gold Coast beaches on a regular basis. Millions of dollars have been spent on beach restoration programs, including dredging and pumping operations. What has now become known as the Gold Coast Seaway was stabilised in 1986 using rock training walls. To overcome the sand build-up problem, a sand bypassing jetty was constructed on the southern side with a series of jets going down into the seabed. The sand is stirred up and pumped under the seaway, discharging on the northern side to continue on its way. No such forethought was applied in the case of the training walls at Tweed Heads, which is at the southernmost end of the Gold Coast. A bypassing scheme similar to that at the Gold Coast Seaway is currently being built and is expected to assist greatly in the restoration and maintenance of the Gold Coast beaches. With the benefit of these experiences, we should be able to avert further problems of this nature. We mustn't take our beaches for granted. Recently, a proposal for an inlet from the ocean at Mermaid Beach was seriously contemplated. There was to be an associated marina and the justification was that an additional outlet would alleviate future flooding as was experienced in 1974. Sam seems to have an opinion on this. They're nuts. They will generate all sorts of horrible problems. People have been doing that sort of thing all around the world and making ghastly mistakes. And the prime example that is the state of Florida, where 80% of the beach erosion problems are caused by constructing new inlets where nature didn't want them and where nature doesn't need them. If you join a seaway from the ocean into the canal system, you, can, you convert that canal system into the river. It will replace the Narang. And all those canals, other than the Narang, are too small, too narrow, and not protected. And like all entrances, like they had to do at the seaway, it's going to continually fill with sand. And when the cyclone comes and the waves whip up the sea, the literal drift increases, and the designers of these walls might like to know that in 1972, Corumban Creek and Talapajara Creek both blocked completely and flooded Palm Beach. And if, they, if the designers want to go through Mermaid, they can expect exactly the same all over again. Sam has been taking daily measurements for 12 years and on a weekly basis going back 20 years. I've been working with two American universities, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, and the other one, the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And PhD students there are busily working on our daily data and every six months I post the next set of spreadsheets to them. The students are working on a computer program to predict the results of storms and cyclones. And what we want to be able to do is get a warning and we need to know if there's been erosion and we've got to do beach nourishment, how much? How long is it going to last? when you're going to need sandbags. If we really get a, a 1 in 500 year cyclone, we'll have enough
plenty of warning to get all the people in the high-rise out of their buildings for the ones close to the beach. This computer program is anticipated to be a world first. The data derived will most certainly be useful in assessing the consequences to the beaches of rising sea levels due to global warming. It is not a case of if we are going to have problems, but when. Without the effort and personal sacrifice of people like Sam, we would be totally unprepared. Beaches are one of the Gold Coast's most precious resources. It's gold. Without it, there is no Gold Coast.